Today I'm going to be telling you about the all-new Ender 3 V3 from Creality. This is Creality's new flagship bedslinger product, and it has more in common with the high-speed Core XY printers than it does with the old-school Ender 3 products. But first, let's talk about why this printer even exists. Now, you almost can't talk about the brand Creality without talking about the Ender 3. That's definitely been one of their best-selling products over the past five years, and it's really what put them on the map as one of the most instantly recognizable and recommendable 3D printer brands on the market. Throughout the years, we've had the Ender 3, the Ender 3 Pro, the Ender 3 V2, the Ender 3 S1, the Ender 3 S1 Pro, the Ender 3 V3 SE and KE. All of that brings us to the latest kind of future generation of Creality products, this Creality K1 and Ender 3 V3 with no suffixes. So this, they just call it the Ender 3 V3. Personally, I think they should call it the Ender 3 K1. Just from an exterior styling perspective, these machines have a lot in common. The print heads kind of look the same. Also, they're both made out of these die-cast aluminum frames. Let's take a closer look at this Ender 3 V3 and see what makes it special. So first off, this machine is fast. I printed out this Benchy in, I think it was like 13 minutes. I did it on live stream, and you can see the print quality is quite good. There's very minimal ringing despite this being printed at an extremely high speed. And I also printed out this torture toaster. I'm not sure what this model's all about, but it was the most requested model when I asked people what I should print on this Ender 3 V3. So here it is. Apparently you're supposed to push this button and see if the toast pops out, and that's a sign that you've got a good printer on your hands. And I can see this toast wobbling, and yeah, there you go. That's real easy. Let's, uh, oh, it doesn't launch all the way out. All right, and just doing that actually unstuck it from the bed, so that's the nice thing about PEI sheets is they'll pop right off the bed when you're done printing. I haven't done one of these before, but I assume this is good. It's all working, apparently. Um, we got our toast here. The toast looks perfect. There's the smallest bit of stringing in there, but that could be cleaned up with a torch or a heat gun or a lighter. So let's take a look inside of the torture toaster. I guess these are like... You know, you're supposed to poke these and see which ones are free to move. So here's the 0.5 millimeter test, 0.4 millimeter. This one's a little stuck. It looks like down here is where it's kind of fused together. Let me just break free that 0.3 millimeter one. I'm pretty sure that one, yeah, that one can be broken free. So now I've got that one moving. Overall, our toast looks good. And then on this side, we have some little overhang tests. You can see all the way up to 80 degrees, we have really good print quality. So really not a whole lot to complain about here. Um, these print in place mechanisms and hinges and stuff are all working wonderfully. So I think this is a pretty good result overall. Here's some text, clock spring 3D, hot makes. Really nice stuff here. It looks like the ringing is well controlled. Let me lock this toaster up and set it aside. Then we've got our Benchy, which, uh, you know, you can take a look at this up close. This printed in somewhere between 12 and 14 minutes. I forget what exactly it said, but that's quite fast and print quality is quite good. Only thing is there's a little bit of evidence of under extrusion. I mean, that's understandable given that this is an extreme speed Benchy. We've got a textured PEI coated spring steel sheet here. It's a really nice build surface to come stock on a machine, and it's one-sided, so anyone hoping for a dual-sided sheet will be disappointed. However, the nice thing about having a different side on the back is that I could apply my 3D printer adhesive on this side and get like a nice smooth surface finish, so at least that gives you options there. I undid the screws for the print head so we can take a look at the insides there. This is something that I really appreciate Creality doing because on the previous designs, I just felt like everything was too crammed in there. Here's my Creality K1. This was the tool head board, and this tiny little thing had everything. You know, it had the stepper motor driver for the extruder on the tool head, it had the accelerometer, it's got the little microprocessor, and everything is basically on this chip. But on this tool head board, they've split it up into two pieces. So there's this front half, which you can see right here. So this is the hot end heater cartridge plug. And then we've got the hot end thermistor up there. And something that's really nice about this is there's no hot glue. Creality has always been like hot gluing their connectors in place. 
which kind of bothers me sometimes, especially when I'm trying to do modifications or repairs. On this one, these are just nice little clicky connectors, so you don't have to worry about undoing hot glue to get those parts changed out. Also, we've got a couple components here, including three LEDs. Those LEDs help backlight the Creality logo here, and it looks pretty slick when it's turned on because of that. And that's about it for what's up front. Right behind this board, ooh, wow. This is interesting. Basically, this whole carriage that's holding on to the hot end and all the components up here, this is a die-cast aluminum piece as well. So Creality have really invested in their aluminum castings. I guess they want to make everything like strong and robust. So, you know, aluminum castings is a way to do that. So yeah, this whole carriage is painted black, but underneath the surface, it's die-cast aluminum. It's cool to the touch and there's threads going directly into that aluminum part. The extruder is tucked in here. I'm kind of curious what's going on in this back cover because that's something that I was not expecting when I unboxed this printer. Um, basically, you have this cooling fan in the front here that blows air kind of down and back onto the part as you're printing it. But also, if you look around back, there's another part cooling fan back here, and that's blowing air kind of down and forward into your part as you're printing it. So to get a closer look at all this stuff, I'm gonna undo a couple more screws on the back. Here we have our part cooling fan in the back. It looks like it's a 4020 fan. Then we have the other half of all the electronics on the hot end. So back here you can see there's like the Trinamic stepper driver which is going to be driving the extruder motor. We got a capacitor there probably for the stepper driver and then a bunch of test probe points. Overall I like this design a lot more than the old design which I felt was just too cramped. I mean sure it does the same thing. With this design they spaced everything out. This is more of that aluminum die cast frame. Let's get this cover installed again. I stripped some of the wiring there. So yeah, if you're putting this together, just exercise a little caution. All right, and let's uh, go back around to the front side here and take a look at some of these last little details. So we already looked at the tool headboard. Right behind it, we have the extruder and stepper motor. And right below that, we have our hot end heat sink and hot end. This heat sink should be a lot better at, well, dissipating heat, you know, which is what a heat sink should be doing. And since you've got this die cast aluminum base right beneath it, it should be transferring a little bit of heat to it through that structural support there. But overall, this is a very sturdy print head assembly. Uh, if we look in here, the sock is a little difficult to remove. I think it's using Creality's new unicorn style nozzle, which I have one here to take a closer look at. Basically, it's got a volcano length melt zone and an integrated heat break and little copper block to transfer the heat from the heat break into this aluminum heat sink. Overall, seems like a nice design there. Now having this proprietary nozzle is a bit of a double-edged sword. While it should be able to melt plastic quite fast and it should, you know, be relatively leak-proof, you have to buy these replacements from Creality. However, what I like about this design is because you can remove this whole heat sink and this whole assembly up to here, you can actually replace this with a different hot end if you wanted to. I imagine it wouldn't be that difficult to stick something like a Rapido or one of the Bamboo Lab hot ends or, you know, basically whatever you wanted into this assembly because all you have to do is remove a couple screws and then you pull all of this off. So in a way, it's paying respect to the previous Ender 3s in maintaining a little bit of modability. So I'm really curious to see what people can come up with with this. If you just remove this whole segment and replace it with something else, you could replace it with a super long hot end. So you could have like a super long melt zone hot end that like goes down to here. And since this uses load cell based bed leveling, it'll level just fine with an all new hot end in there. So yeah, this thing retains a little bit of modability, which I really appreciate. It's not gonna be as moddable of your Ender 3s from years ago, but it should be relatively easy to swap parts out of this thing and do some crazy stuff with it. You can see our four belt ends leading into this print head, which is what you need on a Core XY or Core XZ machine. What's interesting is the top and bottom rails are different sizes. The top one is 10 millimeters and the bottom one's eight millimeters. And another interesting little tidbit here is the top one is using a graphite lined brass bushing 
and the bottom one is using a linear bearing. So I'm not sure what all went into that design process and why they decided to do it this way versus another way. Another interesting thing about this tool head is they've actually spring-loaded this top piece. You can see when I pull it forward, it moves forwards a little bit, but it springs back into a fixed position. So I'm not sure what this is all about. I've noticed the Bamboo Lab P1P tool head that I have does the same thing. So I think it's some way to eliminate backlash or reduce vibrations or something. In any case, I thought it was kind of interesting, so I wanted you to take a look. So there you go. That might also help with backlash as this top bushing wears down. So you should have like a much longer service life. Maybe that's it. Anyways, that's about all I wanted to show you on the hot end. Now you should be pretty familiar with the tool head and how that's all laid out. Let's take a look at the Core XZ system, which is probably the most interesting thing about this machine. We can see all of these exposed belts and uh, linear rods and all that kind of stuff. So let's take a closer look. Up here you can see like some kind of complex assembly of different bearings and whatnot. There's a little spring in there. I know that on systems like this, the belt tension is very important. So getting these belts to be just the right level of tension and balanced across the different belt circuits is important. And it seems like they're accomplishing that with those little springs inside of that, uh, this kind of housing. So you probably loosen it up, let the spring tension it, and then tighten it down. But yeah, you've got a complex bunch of idlers and pulleys and all that kind of stuff. Here's some limit switches. So we've got, I guess, the x-axis limit switch and then the z-axis limit switch. And these are both installed into this little 3D printed housing. So it's kind of interesting. I always like seeing 3D printed parts on 3D printers. This is not printed with FDM though. This is printed with some kind of powder based process because it's got this sugar cube texture. Then if we look down a little ways, we can follow these belts down. Uh, some of them divert off to the side here and kind of go into this, you know, this print head for the Core XZ motion system. Then we've got one belt loop that goes down to the bottom and into this stepper motor. So it's got two stepper motors at the base of the machine here, one on the left side, one on the right side, and they're both the same size, and those are what powers all the motion for your X and Z axes. The actual location where these stepper motors are attached are nice and machined, flat, so that it should be nice and precise and go together well. Now the bed slinger part of this is probably the most familiar to anyone who's got an Ender 3. The bed just slides back and forth and it's got a stepper motor up front using this little pulley to pull this forwards and backwards. We've got really wide linear rails down here. These look like 10 millimeter linear rails so that should be a little bit more robust than the Ender 3 SE and the Ender 3 KE so you should have better print quality at high speed with this printer compared to those other two. And we've got a nice beefy strain relief on the bed here, so you don't have to worry about this getting damaged and posing a fire hazard or anything. I mean, it's possible, but it seems like it's much better built than what you see on some of the competition's printers. The idler pulley in the back here is using a large diameter pulley. Anytime you have high speed equipment and you wanna cut down on friction, if you use a larger pulley gear, you're flexing that belt less, so there's less friction there. But also, the RPM for this pulley is a little bit lower, which means you have less bearing losses. So, lots of interesting stuff going on there. Now, this whole base of the machine is all die-cast aluminum. It looks like we've got a little screw for adjusting the tension of this belt here. Seems to be nicely tuned right now. Then you just plug it in in the back and turn it on and you're good to go. Now, uh, I took a look at the insides of the base of the machine on live stream. Basically, you've got the power supply right here and the main board on this side, and it's just really neat under there. I think they did a great job with the cable management on this machine. So, any questions about this thing? I think it's a really interesting design, and they've done a pretty decent job with it. On the side, we've got a spot for a USB-A port, so you can plug in your flash drives or whatever you want. If you want to run this machine offline, it's a really nice and easy way to do it. I think this thing should be able to work with a webcam. Don't quote me on that, but it should be able to since it's running the same type of clipper that the K1 is running. So you could probably plug a webcam in down here or somewhere on the main board and then attach it uh, maybe to this frame up here. 
There's a couple unoccupied screw spots in the back where it would be a, a nice vantage point looking down at the printer to see what's going on as you're printing. So now that we're familiar with the machine, let's get this thing turned on and see how it operates. I was using the textured PEI sheet last time I was operating this machine and it did a great job. Everything was sticking to it really nicely, but I'm thinking I might want to just flip it over and try out the smooth side with some adhesive. So I'm just going to put some of the sticky stuff on here and uh, go ahead and print with it. The PEI sheet works fine as well. You can use either side of it. I, I'm just wanting to try something different. All right, let's turn this thing on and do some test prints. I want to show you the effect that greases from your fingers can have on these print surfaces. So you can see down here, um, if I zoom in on this, the adhesive is kind of beating up over here, as well as on this side, it's beating up a little bit. That has entirely to do with the grease from my fingers, because that's where I touched this thing when I picked it up and was handling it. So realistically, whenever you're printing or applying some adhesive, you should wipe your bed surface off with soapy water or uh, rubbing alcohol to just get rid of any like oils and stuff that your hands get on it. That's the main reason why parts will come detached on a well-tuned printer. All right, well, let's get printing here. It didn't take too long for this thing to boot up. Let's go to the preloaded models. I guess I'll print out test cube. That only takes 14 minutes, so it'll be a nice fast print and I can show you how this machine operates. Now a couple of fans just turned on. Now's a good time to do some sound test readings because I know you guys love the sound tests, or at least I do. Right now we've got a couple fans on. Looks like the hot end fan is on, cooling off the hot end heat sink. And I believe the main board fan is on inside of the printer making a little bit of noise, as well as the power supply fan. So there's a lot of little sources of noise on this printer. It's a little annoying. I might go in here and do a fan mod. In fact, you can count on me doing a fan mod on this machine just to make it run quieter. In general, it's not too loud. This is it running without any of the part cooling fans on. So we'll get a nice uh, volume reading right now. Let's see what we're at. So about 53 decibels with that part cooling fan on. That's a maximum fan noise situation. Right before that, I don't know what it said on here. It probably said something like 45. Uh, we'll check the footage. And then I was also running some tests when this machine was at idle, just with the power flipped on and nothing else running except for the, uh, the power supply fan, which turns on when the machine's cold. That was 37 decibels. So that's your sound floor. And then it only gets louder from there up to 53 decibels. And then when this machine's running, it can have peaks as high as 63 decibels from the motion system, which we'll hear in a minute. But I really like this light up Creality logo. I think it looks awesome. Let me turn my uh, overhead lights off. And you can see what that looks like. Illuminated, very cool. Okay, now it's going up to the top. It's gonna hit that limit switch. Now it's going back down to, uh, I guess, do something else. So as you can see, it's quite fast. I think this is maybe a little bit slower than its absolute maximum speed. This is probably more going for print quality. So this will show off kind of the, the high quality that you can get. This was printed using the Creality K1's standard profile, this uh, torture toaster. So this is a good indication of like the typical print quality that you'll get. I mean, overall, I think it's very good. And then this print right here, this should be more of an indication of like the max print quality that you can get. Then of course you've got the speed benchy, which is tuned to be completed as fast as possible, making any sacrifices for print quality that you need to, to get it done. So this is kind of the low end of what you can expect in terms of print quality. Let's let this finish up. Maybe we'll throw in a longer print time lapse, and then we'll get into the final thoughts about this Creality K1. Oh, sorry this Ender 3 V3.
All right, let's pop this off. Oh, there's a little tolerance test built into this thing. All of them down to 0 0.2 seem to be working. All the way up to 15 degrees, also known as 75 degrees. The overhangs look decent. Oddly enough, the overhangs for 20 degrees look better than the overhangs for 30 degrees. Not sure how that works, but there you go. Um, 45 degrees looks fine. Yeah, that's just a little bit of oddness here. I'm surprised that one right there is having um, any bits of ugliness. Maybe we'd need to turn the temperature down a little bit or something. What do you think about this glossy finish on the bottom of these parts? Super shiny. That's what I like about non-textured surfaces is that you, you get like really flat and shiny parts that way. And I think it looks pretty cool. Of course, you can use the textured side of this. You just get the textured bottom surface, but I like this shininess. Super nice. So, I don't know, this print adhesive seems to work pretty well. You can pick some up at Luke's Lab. Link in the description down below. But yeah, let's see. What do we have here? Looks like there's a little bit of fuzz on this retraction tower. But... That should come right off. In terms of the sidewalls, there's basically no ringing or issues there. Now keep in mind, we're looking really closely at this thing. It looks like in terms of bridging distance, once you get to about, maybe this is 50 millimeters, then it's drooping a little bit with this particular filament. But up to that point, it looks pretty good. Bottom surface looks fine. Here's some more bridging. Nice result. These, uh, so little retraction towers are relatively strong too. I don't print this model very often, so I don't know what to tell you. It looks okay. Might as well do some more close-ups of the torture toaster as well. Uh, I think I'm just gonna use this machine for a little while and do a longer term review once I've built up enough opinions about it. But for now, it seems to be just a really nice fast printer that works right out of the box. This retraction test only took an hour and a half, so very quick. All right, so after printing with this Ender 3 V3 for a couple of days, running a bunch of little test prints and each of them looking as good as any other printer on the market, it's got me wondering, what's the point of this 3D printer? Why would you get this over other printers in the market? Basically, it's an Ender 3, but it's also kind of like a K1. It's fast, it's easy to set up and use, and it looks cool. Is that enough of a reason to motivate you to buy this over some of the other printers on the market, or maybe even some of Creality's other 3D printers? Well, I think it really just comes down to ease of use. This was one of the easiest printers for me to unbox and get printing from Creality. And I know people like to throw around the phrase, it just works, but for this printer, for me, it just worked. I unboxed it, put it together, and started up some test prints. Even this torture toaster, which I sliced using some random profile that I thought would be good enough to run on this machine, worked fine. I didn't have to do any tuning, I didn't do any tweaking. I just sliced this using some pre-made slicer settings that weren't even for this machine specifically, and it worked great. Since this isn't a tuned profile, there's probably a little bit of performance left on the table. I probably could have had it printed a little bit faster or with a little bit better quality. But in terms of something that just cranks out parts when you need them, I think this would be a good machine for the job. When I first heard about this machine, I thought, oh man, Core XZ, nobody needs that. That's just marketing hype. And to some extent, that might be true. I have some other benchies from some other 3D printers, and they look just as good as the one that came off of this Ender 3 V3. So it's like, what's the point of doing this Core XZ kinematic design? Is it marketing hype? Maybe. But it's got the performance to back it up, so at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters. There are a couple of things that I'd like to see Creality address with these designs. One is the noise that this machine makes. It's kind of loud. I prefer my machines to be really quiet. If I can get something that's under 50 decibels, that's like awesome for me because I can just leave that running and I won't even notice it. But something like this that's unenclosed with relatively large part cooling fans to support high-speed printing 
that just kind of ends up being louder. So if noise levels are your primary concern, you might want to look at a printer that's more enclosed or maybe something that's a little bit slower, just because you know, the high speed kind of necessitates that it makes a lot of noise. One machine that immediately comes to mind in terms of being super fast and super quiet is the Adventure 5M Pro. So that might be something you'd want to check out if you're looking for the absolute quietest machine. But this machine honestly wasn't too bad, and if you're not in the room with it, it's not loud enough to like disturb you the next room over. Also, I find that Creality's implementation of Clipper and the user interface that you get with this screen is really nice. It's fast and responsive and allows you to do most things without issue. The only thing that I wish they included was a way to do some of the fine-tuning adjustments, like being able to adjust the flow percentage on some of these models, like this Benchy when it was trying to print as fast as possible. I noticed a little bit of under extrusion, and I'd like to maybe tweak the temperature up a little bit and turn up the flow ratio just a tiny bit. But I was missing those options on the touch screen, so pretty much the way that they want you to use this machine is just fire and forget. Just start up your print job and then, you know, come back when it's done. And it does a relatively good job of that. All of these prints, I just kind of started them up and came back when they were done, and they all turned out great. But I think the best way to look at this machine is to put it in context with the rest of Creality's lineup. It's basically an Ender 3 format printer, but it has all the performance of a Core XY machine. So it's just as fast as the K1, it kind of is really similar in a lot of ways to this K1, but it's going to be a little bit less expensive because you don't have to pay for this whole enclosure, and it's got some slightly updated hardware. All the stuff that I saw on the hot end, I think, is probably what's going to feed into Creality's next generation. Eventually, I assume they're going to come out with a K2 printer. And I bet you're going to see a lot of the things that they installed on this printer on the next version of the K-series. Also, when the K1 first came out, there was some issues with the extruder. There was uh, a couple issues with the hot end that some people were experiencing. On this machine, everything's been like, you know, they've gone through a couple iterations, and they actually delayed the release of this product for a little while while they like finished up the design and made sure that it was good to ship. Which is, frankly, it's kind of uncommon to see Creality doing that. Um, and any 3D printing company. I feel like a lot of these products are rushed to market. But instead of pushing this product out the door like Creality could have done if they would have stuck to their November or October release date, they took their time, they fixed the things they needed to fix, and they got this design right before they shipped it. So I hope this is a new trend that we see from Creality and other manufacturers. I know um, another major manufacturer just had a recall for the heated bed cables being insufficiently insulated or protected, and they're kind of catching on fire. You know, that's a really bad thing to happen, and it's something that you can sort out with sufficient testing and make sure you're not shipping customers potentially dangerous products. So it's an Ender 3 with K1 levels of performance, but the other thing that I really like about it is since the hot end and heat sink modules are kind of separated out from the rest of the tool head, one complaint I had on the K1 is that it's all kind of a monoblock where you can't really change parts very easily. On this one, they're kind of separated out a little bit, so I'm pretty sure you could do a full hot end replacement on this machine. You might even be able to do a full uh, extruder replacement without too much issues on this machine. And also, in general, just the ease of use and the aesthetics that they've included on this new design are just top notch. When you compare it to the rest of the printers in the Ender 3 lineup, it's faster, it looks better, and you know, it's just kind of the top end machine. But at the same time, it's probably one of the least moddable Ender 3s. On a lot of other Ender 3s, you use like typical belt and pulley setups, you use like standard stepper motors and Z axis lead screws and aluminum extrusion. So you can pull parts off of printers and kind of mix and match on the previous Ender 3s which is great for people who like modifying their 3D printers. But with this machine, you're pretty much just going to buy this and use it as Creality intended, which is in this configuration. Again, it should be more moddable than the K1, but it's not going to be as moddable as the previous generations of Ender 3. I think for the last five years, Creality hadn't really been taking the design of its 3D printers seriously enough. Like, they haven't been investing enough into new products, and when they came out with new products, it was usually just their old product, that was just kind of reskinned and rebranded into a new product. You would see them carry over a lot of parts from the old design into the new design, so it was always kind of constrained, and it seemed like the, the main goal was to 
minimize the amount of spending that they had to do to develop new products. I mean, just think about the Ender 3 to the Ender 3 Pro. It's basically the same printer, but they swapped out a couple of components. Then the Ender 3 Pro to the Ender 3 V2. Again, very minimal changes. It's basically the same frame with a different main board. And I mean, the extruder and the hot end and everything about it was virtually the same, but they kind of touted it as a new model. Then you had the Ender 3 S1, which was a good step forward, but they were still reusing a lot of the old components from their other 3D printers. And it really feels like they were failing to make the next step into the next generation. With this K1 and the Ender 3 V3, I think they were getting some strong signals from the market that they really needed to reinvent themselves. And they spent a lot of time and money and research and development for these products to hopefully come up with something that would leapfrog the competition and get ahead of them instead of, you know, trying to play catch up. And it's not just this printer that's really showing me that Creality is taking their designs more seriously. It's the entire Ender 3 lineup. Whether you're talking about the Ender 3 V3 SE, which is bringing a bunch of ease of use features and like a higher level of build quality to their low end, low cost machines, or the Ender 3 V3 KE, which is a clipperized high speed bed slinger that's still relatively moddable and built with inexpensive components, or the full on Ender 3 V3 that we just took a look at today. I think all these machines are showing a renewed interest in producing good 3D printer designs at Creality. With Creality's last generation of products, that's the S1 lineup, it was a nice improvement to get all those additional features like automatic bed leveling and a direct drive extruder, but I felt like it wasn't enough to stay competitive in today's market. Also, they increased the price of their products, which I wasn't a big fan of because I like saving money. I don't like recommending products that are super expensive. And if you're paying extra for a 3D printer, I wanna see a lot of extra build quality and reliability and just a better user experience. Fortunately, this new generation of Ender 3s addresses that need, but also comes in at a lower price than its predecessors. So, you know, it's just good all around, and I just really like where they're going with this new lineup of products. There's only a couple of brands that are taking the ease of use of 3D printing to kind of the next level where it's like super easy to use. Those brands are Creality with their automatic Z offset and fully automated calibration, Bamboo Lab, which has much of the same, you know, fully automated calibration procedures. Flash Forge with the Adventure 5M line, that does calibration all on its own. And the Anchor Make printers, which is the Anchor Make M5 and M5C. Those also use a load cell to, you know, fully automate the, the setup process. And also, I can't forget about the Prusa MK4 and Prusa XL. Those printers are all making an ecosystem that just makes their printers easier to use. They have their own slicers that lets you send files to them remotely really easily. And they have load cell based bed leveling to make sure that uh, you get the perfect first layer without having to do all this extra calibration manually. So yeah, I really like where Creality is going with this stuff. Um, I think the industry in general is heading in the right direction and it's getting easier and easier than ever and also less expensive than ever to get into 3D printing and get good results. So I think that's a good thing for the industry and I'm really happy with the amount of competition that's going on with 3D printing companies constantly trying to outdo each other and producing better products for us the consumers. And I think they've done a good job at that. This is a very high performance machine. Um, it was really easy to use. The user experience has been awesome so far and I'm just looking forward to using it a little bit more over the next couple of weeks. I plan on coming out with a longer term review for this machine that will kind of coincide with the product launch for this. I'll just keep printing with it. So far it's been really nice and easy to print with and it seems like a machine that I can just rely on to get my parts made. So all my other Creality machines I always viewed them as being like okay yeah it works um, but the main reason I really like this printer is because I can mod it and mess around with the design. And this machine that's not really going to be the case. I'm just going to leave it stock and uh, run plastic through it and use it to prototype my parts for my upcoming projects and just, you know, see how that goes. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It got a little bit long with the history lesson and the philosophy of Creality's Ender 3 lineup. But I feel like I've been following the Ender 3 lineup from the beginning. I got into Creality products with the Ender 3 Pro and the Ender 3 V2 and those were really fun machines. Uh, they were fun yet frustrating but challenging and like that was part of the fun of owning them was fixing them and doing mods and all that kind of stuff. I guess eventually I got fed up with them and I threw them off of a balcony and destroyed them like casting the ring into Mordor. 
But um, these new products, they're just, you know, you buy them, you plug them in, and you start using them. Whether it's the Ender 3 V3 SE, the Ender 3 V3 KE, the CR10 SE, or the Ender 3 V3, the one we have here, they're all designed for you to just put them together, press play, and get printing. I think this is a good step for Creality. I just wish they maintained a little bit of that modder DNA because I do like having the ability to pull parts off of them and put new stuff in uh, that I feel like is lost on a lot of other companies and printers. But hopefully if all goes according to plan, we'll have something for the modders to use on their Ender 3 V3 SEs and Ender 3 V3 KEs. So uh, stay tuned for that. Anyways, if you watched this far, thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and like the video. That really helps out my channel. And I'll see you in the next episode.